Good morning. Thank you, Jackie. Good morning to all of you who are here in the House of God. Uh, this is, uh, I'm standing behind the communion table, so you know that this is a Sunday we come together to celebrate Holy Communion. And I want to invite all of you who are watching us, those who are joining us over Facebook Live, and later on, when you're watching during the weekend, week, during the week, uh, you can participate in the Holy Communion. It doesn't have to be on Sunday, but you can do it on your own time, in your own way, but take part in the Holy Communion, which is important. It is not a ritual, but it is an important reminder to all of us that how extensively, how wonderfully God's unconditional love is given to all of us. This whole table reminds us of God's love, God's sacrifice for us and Jesus' love for us. And so I want to welcome all of you who are joining us on Facebook Live as well. So this morning, uh, uh, we are especially blessed with uh, different musical uh, presentations in the choir. And uh, later on, uh, John will play the clavinova. And of course, as usual, we have a wonderful choir to listen to and wonderful people to sing as well. And I invite uh, Jean Shaviak, our worship leader, to come and lead us. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to add my welcome to those of you here in the sanctuary, as well as those of you who are watching on Facebook and will be seeing the recording later this week. The beautiful flowers on the altar this morning were arranged by Kate Henson, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of those were from her garden. She's quite the gardener, so it's really nice to have them. Important announcement. The UMW meeting is tomorrow at 5.30. On the announcements, it had the wrong day, so Patty asked me to let you all know it's tomorrow at 5.30. And our choir will sing their introit, and then Zarina Khan will lead us in the beginning of our service. Good morning. Good morning. Keep standing. Call to worship. Walk humbly before the Lord, even in hardship and pain. We will live with integrity before God all day of our lives. We, uh, walk faithfully before our God, even when put to the test. We will honor the Lord our God all day of our lives. Come, let us worship, opening him 519. Mm -hmm. Oh 
Opening prayer. Almighty God, God you, you spoke, spoke to our ancestors our long ago through your prophets and teachers, but today, but today you speak to you us speak through to your us Son. Through During your the life's trials and tribulations, help us keep our integrity and walk faithfully, faithfully in your ways. Help, Help us, us listen, listen to the words, to the words of, your son, of your son and become like children again, again, that we may rejoice in our kingdom and trust, and trust in your spirit. Your spirit. In, in Christ's Christ name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Our scripture lesson for this morning is from the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. A man in the land of Uz was named Job. That man was honest, a person of absolute integrity. He feared God and avoided evil. One day, the divine beings came to present themselves before the Lord. The adversary also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to the adversary, where have you come from? The adversary answered the Lord, from wandering throughout the earth. The Lord said to the adversary, have you thought about my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a man who is honest, who is of absolute integrity, who reveres God and avoids evil. He still holds on to his integrity, even though you incited me to ruin him for no reason. The adversary responded to the Lord, skin for skin, people will give up everything they have in exchange for their lives. But stretch out your hand and strike his bones and flesh. Then he will definitely curse you to your face. The Lord answered the adversary, there he is, within your power, only preserve his life. The adversary departed from the Lord's presence and struck Job with severe store, sores from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. Job took a piece of broken pottery to scratch himself and sat down on a mound of ashes. Job's wife said to him, are you still clinging to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job said to her, you're talking like a foolish woman. Will we receive good from God, but not also receive bad? In all this, Job didn't sin with his lips. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second hymn this morning is number 630. Become to us the living bread. I didn't think I was going to make it back in three verses, going to the office and back. Uh, but it's important that I have my book of worship with me for later on. So this morning's scripture is something very pertinent to all of us. One time or the other, we have asked this question about hanging in there, holding on. So high above a small village in the French Alps towers a famous mountain named Mont Blanc. 
Hoang Tuang serves as a permanent challenge to mountain climbers. Nearby is an even more difficult and dangerous crag called in English, Fool's Needle. That mountain sounds appropriately named to me, Fool's Needle. Why do mountain climbers tie themselves to one another? Asks the old joke. To keep the sensible ones from going home. The Fool's Needle is standing at 11,487 feet high. Only the more experienced mountaineers even attempt to scale its slopes. Sometime back, a young student was trapped for three days on the north face of Fool's Needle. He was dangling from a narrow ledge when rescue workers found him. His hands were frozen, and later from a hospital bed, he talked about the harrowing ordeal I repeated over and over to myself, he said, I must hold on. I must hold on at any price. I must hold on. Friends, there are times in our lives journey when many of us will whisper these desperate words. I must hold on. I must hold on. People will encourage us, hang in there. Hang in there. You know, there was an interesting man in the Old Testament who certainly knew what it was to hold on. His name was Job. Listen as the author of this drama describes Job in the land of Oz, southeast of Jordan River. There lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless, upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He was the example in that society, in that community, in that land where God and everybody was pleased with his life. He was a man who had something everybody looked up to. Now, this is an interesting twist. Right at the beginning of Job's story, the good fortune came as a result of a righteous lifestyle. In the Old Testament, if you lived as God would have you live, you would be blessed financially, physically, as well as spiritually. Now, the question is, do you agree with this theology? There are many who have this approach to faith even today. I don't know many of Jesus' original followers who occupied beautiful, ornate mansions. In fact, Jesus challenged his followers to set aside everything, leave everything. Even the rich young ruler, he said, ruler, he said, leave everything and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. See the contrast. Yet here we are introduced to a man who was chosen to experience unbelievable pain and suffering. The reason he was chosen to experience these tragic circumstances was that he was not only wealthy, he was blameless and upright, and he feared God and shunned evil. Now, what more can you ask for a human being? And you know the story. During the conversation between God and the fallen angel Satan, God allowed Satan to strip away from Job everything he held dear. If you continue to read the rest of the passages, chapters, his family, his friends, his health, his wealth, nothing was spared except his life. His body was covered with awful sores. His friends accused him of some secret sin. Because of that, you know, God is punishing you openly. Since it was an important piece of the Old Testament theology that suffering was a byproduct of sin. But Job knew he had not committed any sin. Even God knew that. Even God testifies to that. And desperately, yet there he was, holding on. And no one in this sanctuary has suffered quite like Job, but few of us may have come close. It may be a problem with our health, or a problem with someone we love, or a problem in our workplace. If that describes your life, only you know. Whatever that problem may be, there is a battle going on. And you are not sure that you can endure, you can hold on. So what is the secret of holding on? When you are down to your last shred of hope, when there is no longer enough rope to even make a knot to hang on to it, where do you find help with such times? Let me give you some simple steps that I'm convinced will help. First, learn to live one day at a time. It is not easy. It is not easy for me, it is not easy for any one of us. One day at a time. Jesus was giving us one of the greatest lessons of life when he said, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. 
Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know, you may know the story of the city man who went out to the country and watched a farmer sawing along with the long, even measured strokes. The city person said, here, let me saw the log. He also started with the slow, measured strokes, and before long, he accelerated the tempo. After a few moments, the frantic sawing, the stroke went crooked, and the saw got caught. The city man said, I guess I didn't so well after all. The farmer replied, it's because you allowed your mind to get ahead of the saw. You allowed your mind to get ahead of the saw. Sometimes you and I may have the tendency to do that too. To let our mind get ahead of the saw. We live not in the now, but in the terrible what if. Do you know about the what ifs? What if the lump is cancerous? What if the business failed? What if she gets involved with the wrong kind of boy? We add to today's burdens the burdens of an imagined tomorrow, a tomorrow that may never come, at least not in the form we imagine. There is an old Swedish saying that is translated, there is no cow on the ice, on the roof. It means there is nothing to worry about. Don't worry about something that may never happen. But of course, if there is both an ice and a cow on your roof, you should start worrying about it. Pastor James Gordon Gilkey had a great illustration for helping us understand how to view the challenges and problems that worry us. He said that most of us view our lives as if we are standing in the middle of the circle and the problems, the challenges, and the fear, and the burdens surround us and pushing in on us, trying to take away our breath. Sometimes we feel like we are being crushed from outside. They're pushing in on us. And we can relate to that kind of description. He said that it is more accurate to picture our life as an hourglass. There is a large bowl at the top and the large bowl at the bottom. They are connected by thin time that only allows one grain of sand to flow through at, time, at a time. No matter how busy, how burdened, how hectic our lives have been, we need to focus only on the challenge that is present at the moment. Not on the previous challenge, not on the next challenge, one challenge at a time. One test at a time, one job at a time. Focus on mastering this present moment. And you will find yourself better equipped to face the stresses of the day. My friends, it's so easy to ignore instruct Jesus' instructions against worrying. It is so easy to defend our obsession with anxiety. Is it, that re is it really that wrong? Let's say we eliminated worry from our lives. What would replace it? I want to read to you a quote from Francois Fenelon, a French bishop who lived in the 17th century. Bishop Fenelon wrote, don't worry about the future. Worry quenches the work of grace within you. The future belongs to God. God oversees all things. Never second guess God. I hope we hear that. And I hope we keep it in our hearts. He says, don't worry about the future. Worry quenches the work of grace within you. The future belongs to God. God oversees all things, never second guess God. God is sovereign over all things. Think about how this is true in your life and my life. Worry quenches the work of grace within us. How often have you looked back at some tough time in your life and seen overwhelming evidence that God was in control? I ask myself, why didn't I see God's mercy and power at work in that moment of suffering? Because you let worry quench the work of grace within you. How can you help Replace worry with the work of God's grace in your life. Jesus said you can start by living life one day at a time. You see, on one level, Job's problems were much more severe than any that you and I, you and I, or I, likely to face. On the other hand, we complicate our lives by adding dread 
about tomorrow to today's concerns. So we may not actually cope as well as Job did. Let go of tomorrow and enjoy living this one moment. Live one day at a time. That is the first key. The second one is very important. One. Remember that you are loved. You know, I preach so many times. I've been in so many times. I've said, remember, you are loved. And I think we hear it more often than we can pay attention to it at times. Remember, you are loved. The feeling of being loved is the most critical factor in our ability to function as whole human beings. When we do not feel loved, we do not develop the emotional and psychological resources we need to cope with life's various stresses. The greatest need that we have is to love and to be loved. But in the absence of that love, we become stunted emotionally and psychologically. Many people have an innate sense of dread about life. We do not have the psycholo we do not have what the psychologist Erickson called a basic sense of trust. So we grow helpless in the face of adversity, or we panic and do dumb things. But the thing is, do we not know? Have we not heard? There is one who loves us so much that he gave his own son in our behalf. Live one day at a time. Recognize that you are loved. The Holy Communion reminds us that. The Holy Communion reminds us unequivocally that God loves you unconditionally and God sent his son to die for you. God has proven beyond a shadow of doubt when Jesus died on the cross for you. And even beyond the Big Bang, beyond the beginning, God has loved us. Scripture talks about God has loved us even before the foundations of the earth were laid. His love is everlasting to everlasting. It will not go away. Because Jesus, when he returns, he will fulfill that obligation by God. And finally, the third key is learn how to let go. You know, it's a paradox. The best way to hold on is to let go. As someone has put it beautifully, let go and let God. We need to know now to release, our, how to release our fears, our worries, our guilt, our anger, our resentment. There are times when we simply need to let go. Easily said than done. But notice, Job didn't really find an answer to that question either. They accept to keep holding on to his faith in God. And in the end, he would see that at the end of the book, he would see that indeed God was his redeemer who lives. He questioned God and he tried all kinds of things. He even was angry with God. And God was angry with him at times. And I said, who do you think you are? But at the end of the day, Job found that his redeemer lives. In all these things, that is the ultimate thing. The Redeemer lives. The one who died for you, the one who died for me, the one who died for the world lives. The Redeemer lives. Friends, if you read the scriptures through the pages of human history, you discover that God works through strengths and weaknesses, through wins and losses, through victories and heartbreaks. If we could control the future, we would eliminate all frustrations and heartbreaks. Then we also miss opportunities for growth for faith and for compassion, for overcoming. We would miss the grace of God. It is in holding on, enduring, not giving up on God. That's where we see God's power and God's love most clearly. And we learn that we can trust God through every circumstance, even when we cannot see God. Arthur Marion Bond West tells of a time when she felt far away from God. You know the pain of walking through a season like that. It was the middle of August, a blazing, sweltering day, and she happened to see a dog sitting on the sidewalk outside a McDonald's restaurant. Inside the restaurant, she met the dog's owner, a homeless man named Johnny. Johnny's dog's name was Cheeseburger. Johnny could have found a comfortable place to stay 
at the local homeless shelter. But the shelter didn't accept dogs. Instead, Johnny erected a tent in the woods nearby. He, was going, he wasn't going anywhere without cheeseburger. When Marion asked Johnny about his own needs, she was struck by his answer. He said, here's the way it works. Every morning, me and Cheeseburger step out of our tent and look up at the sky, and I say, Lord, we belong to you. We trust you. Take care of us another day. Thank you. And then at night, when we lie down to sleep and lay down to sleep, I look out at the stars and say, we still trust you, God. And he smiled at her. As Marion drove away, she couldn't find, stop thinking about the deep faith and peace that Johnny radiated. It was an inner peace that, peace that had been lacking in her own life lately. So at the next traffic light, she glanced up at the sky and prayed one simple prayer. Lord, I belong to you. I trust you. Take care of me another day. And thank you. And she drove away with a fresh sense of peace she had an experience in some time. You see, Job did not have the advantage that you and I have. He didn't have the life or the teachings of Jesus to look to. He knew and trusted God, but he did not know how God, committed God was to his well-being. You know, that simple phrase, how committed God is for each one of us, our well-being. It is not haphazard. It is not on and off. It is not when God says, hey, I don't think you're doing what I expect you to do, so you know, I'm not committed to you. God's relationship with humanity, the one which created, he created so wonderfully, is committed relationship. No matter our unfaithfulness, no matter what we do, no matter whether we believe or not, God's committed to this relationship. And eventually he will bring humanity, which he so wonderfully fashioned, Put his own spirit into it. Put his own Holy Spirit into it. To bring it to completion. God is committed to this relationship. And to his well-being of every individual. It is mankind who needs to get this. How committed God is to a well-being of our neighbors. And so therefore we are also committed to the welfare of our well-being of our neighbors and our friends and those who are here, those who are abroad, those who are far away, we will never see them in this life. Only Christ can give us that assurance because he died on the cross for us. Live one day at a time. Remember, there is someone who loves you and upon whom you can cast your burden. Learn the art of releasing your troubles. Let go and let God. Let go of them. Let God catch them and care for them. Keep holding on to God through God's Son, Jesus Christ. Keep holding on to Him. Keep holding on to Him. In closing, I want us to pray the prayer which Marian prayed. I, I will read and then you can repeat after me. Let us pray. Will you repeat after me? Lord, I belong to you. Lord, I trust you. Please take care of me another day. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let us continue our worship as we bring God's tithes and our offerings.
Please join me, pray of thanksgiving and gratitude. God of love, of love just, just as you speak to us through a son, speak to your world through our gifts. May our offering receive your blessing and go forth to bring life and love to a world in need of both. In the loving name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and every way to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets who look for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
blessed is your son Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. You healed the sick, fed the hungry and ate with sinners. For the baptism of suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood by your spirit make us one with Christ one with each other one in ministry to the entire world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in your holy church all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I want us to join in the reading which is printed right below the Great Thanksgiving. Let us read that together as a prayer this morning. Let us pray. Source of unity and strength in our longing for wholeness, we reach out to your Son, whose touch heals our brokenness. In our yearning for community, we take hold of the promises of Christ whose life and love bind us together as one. From lives of separation and distrust, knit us into one family, where all are welcomed and honored, as we share the bread of life and drink the cup of salvation. Forge us anew as one people of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you and for you and for you. The blood of Christ shed for you and for you and for all of us.
We come now to our time of sharing of joys and concerns. And one big joy is October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So we're really blessed to have Pastor Sundar. We thank him for everything he's done for us, especially this last difficult year. Um, some other joys we have. Several of us were happy to hear from Carrie Pierce in the last week and to know that she's doing really well settling in in her retirement community and she's really busy with music and other activities. So that's a real joy to know. And several birthdays coming up. Um, Laura Clark's birthday is tomorrow and Patty Chartrand and Yvonne de Bellis have birthdays on Tuesday. So um, happy birthday to them. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Gloria you, Penny and Yvonne. Happy birthday to you. As always, we have many, many concerns. Um, and we heard just before the service uh, that Gail Welkley's brother passed away early this morning and she's asking for prayers for, especially for her sister-in-law and for the family. Um, we also would like to pray for the family of Bill Wild. He died last year and will be buried locally next week. We pray for Joan Fryer, for Patty Buono, for Barbara Shoemaker and family, for Ann Lamb and family on the loss of her Aunt Dorothy. We pray for Cecilia and Lauren, Jeff Combs, David Stevens, Sawyer Quinn, Grayson Burns, Donald and Betty Gibson, Janice Bachenik, Barbara Hammond, James McChrist. We pray for the family of Michelle Iorio, for Leah Buono, for Bob and Ellen Crabtree, for Sherry St. Louis, for the family of Ivy Scottle upon her recent passing, for Karen and Carmela, for Don and Janet Jukes, for Krista Schiffer and Valerie Peratt's parents. We pray for John Moore, Jacob Jalal, for Lon Skiff, Fred Van Ornum, Lucy Engelhart, Charlotte Young, Karen Jevisinski, Betty Lennon, for the family of Dave Belden, Judy Davis, Sandy Cummins, Joe McManus. We pray for Bill Coran, Anna Reitz, Kathy Roberts, Stephen Burnett, Stephen Ludy, Linda Hill, and King, Kim Kingsbury. We pray for Lois Phoenix, Deb Samuel, Morgan Pace, Joanne Pace, Paul Smith, David Smith, for Richard Smith, for Nellie Smith. We pray for Tim Parat, Elizabeth Shelnut, Stephen Frawley, and for all the residents of Riverside, Rosewood, Eddie Heritage House, Van Rensselaer Manor, Atria Gilderland, Diamond Hill, and Hawthorne Ridge. We pray for all of these people as well as those we hold quietly in our hearts as we sing together our call to prayer. Lord, we belong to you, we trust you, take care of us another day. We humble ourselves before you, O God, creator, sustainer, giver of life, provider of all those good things you, we enjoy each day. We see your handiwork all over the world. 
we thank you for this beautiful creation. You made us part of it. Help us, O oh Lord, to be good stewards of all that you do entrusted to us in our nation, in our homes, and in our lives. Almighty and ever-living God, we come here to worship you and to praise you and to go away from this place as those who have been in the presence of a living God. Transform us, O oh Lord, and use us for your glory. May your love and grace shine and through us, in and through us. Speak to us once more as we go in the lanes and by lanes that as we share the good news of Christ's love with one another. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for this wonderful, well-endowed nation which you have given to us, short period of time, as a gift to take care of it and to watch over it and to be responsible for it and to give an account for it in the day when we stand before you. Our gracious and loving God, we pray for our leaders, the Congress, and those who are in authority. We pray for our president, his family, the vice president, and her family. We pray for all the states and their governors. We ask your blessings upon them. May they walk in your ways and may they walk in your fear that they may do the right thing at all times. Almighty and ever-living God, we pray for those names which are lifted up, especially we lift up Gail's family. We ask your blessings upon them and comfort them and console them in the loss of a, a brother and a son and a husband and a father. Gracious and loving God, we pray for Gail's sister-in-law in this loss that you would comfort and console her. Give her your grace for each day, knowing that you are there for her, in and through her family. Loving God, we pray that you would go with us as we go from here, having been blessed, having been refreshed at your table. Help us to go with strength from strength to serve you as your people. This I pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next song is 2221. In unity, we lift our song. There is a one word I wanted to share with you. Ken Mirama is a blind singer and a author of the music, and he plays wonderful uh, organ, and you name it, he has the gift of it. I watched him many times when I was in California, and he would produce music between sessions. He would produce different musical selections based on the previous session. Is that gifted. And I'm so glad to see his name here and sing one of his hymns this morning. 2221, Unity will lift our song. Will you please stand if you're able to? Stories told and told again to 
Will you please join me in the benediction, which is a responsive reading? Let us pray. As you have refreshed us at your table, as you have shared your sacred meal with us, as you have blessed us with your loving presence, 